In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Gospel reading contrasts two responses to Jesus Christ, belief and unbelief. Jesus' methodology in inviting people to believe is not to argue or pester or manipulate or cajole. It is simply to invite, to offer the gift of himself, of life in him, to anyone who will receive it. The story takes place at the temple in Jerusalem, the Monday or Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus, of course, will be arrested on Thursday night, crucified on Friday. He knows his time is short. And the religious leaders are growing more and more furious with this man whom they perceive to be a kind of upstart, an uneducated country peasant with no right or place or credentials to talk about God, much less to proclaim who is coming into the kingdom of God. Jesus was gaining popularity, undermining the control of the religious leaders, and making statements that they considered to be blasphemous. The temple system, which was the center of Jewish life and of the religious uh, leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, identity in the sacrificial system was concerned about preserving that law and tradition as an identity of the people in the covenant of Moses as God's chosen people. And any threat to that system, as was represented by Jesus in his statement, was to be isolated and eliminated. So the showdown is set. Who will come out on top in this battle of who will be able to come into the kingdom of God. And so in the story, because they are already suspicious of Jesus, the chief priests and the elders are seeking to trap him in his own words in order to have some legal basis to arrest and try him as a false teacher. If he is heard saying something contrary to the law, critical of the temple, the evidence can be presented against him by witnesses, which is what in fact happens on Thursday night at his mock trial when witnesses come and accuse Jesus of having made outlandish statements like, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. So for the religious leaders, this is a kind of tactic that might be used in a jury trial that has gone awry if a prosecuting attorney said to a defendant on the stand, when did you stop beating your wife? It would likely be an objection. This is the style of interrogation that the religious leaders are employing. Guilty is Jesus until proven guilty and then really guilty suffering the consequences of that. So Jesus is aware of this. He is aware of exactly the kinds of plots that are already going on in secret quarters in the temple and in Jerusalem to have him arrested. But he stays focused on his kingdom. He doesn't want to get into a, an argument with these people. He wants to do what he's done throughout his ministry, which is to invite them into God's loving embrace. And so he very adroitly changes the conversation from who is acting on God's authority to the deeper, more personal, more important question of who is obeying God. And after employing a short parable about obedience, he says a profound and unsettling thing, especially if you are among the religious leaders or elders of the establishment, Jesus says, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Ouch. Why were some of the most notorious sinners in the culture going into the kingdom ahead of these who were supposed to be the holiest and most observant represent representatives of God? Jesus would say a very simple answer, because they want to, because they chose to come. 
They chose belief. They changed their lives, followed a new path, all of which is about entering the realm of God's rule and reign, God's kingdom. In a hierarchical society such as the one in which Jesus lived, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, as you might imagine, were at the very bottom. They were the jobs of last resort, people driven to desperate means simply to survive. Everyone around tax collectors and prostitutes would have despised them. They were perceived as betrayers of the people through money and sex, a form of institutionalized dehumanization. What they most desired and are least likely to receive in that culture is any kind of acceptance or respect or dignity. But in Jesus of Nazareth, they are offered exactly that. Though they are mistreating themselves and others, Jesus recognizes their inherent value as people. Their behavior does not change the fact that they are beloved by God. They had been, they are, and forever would be. And as we learn in other parts of the Gospels, because Jesus offered this love and acceptance, many tax collectors and prostitutes, as well as all kinds of other socially disreputable people, became disciples. Jesus is saying something profoundly revolutionary about the dignity of the human person. Everyone. And he means and lived the reality that everyone, even those at the social bottom, are worthy of dignity and respect as children of God and are offered forgiveness and new life. And so as we reflect on this gospel's meaning for us, I think the key word comes down to this repentance, the changing of mind, which Jesus says is the entry point into the kingdom of God, which anyone can make. Now the word repent may have ominous or negative associations for some of us, but it is actually a rich, hopeful, and exciting biblical theme. It simply means to change one's mind and then to go in a different direction. It includes openness to new information, new truth that can be recognized, accepted, and lived out in my daily life. It is more than just a one-act event, it is a practice and an attitude of mind which will result in a new orientation, a regrounding in the good, the true, the beautiful of God's presence. It lifts us out of pride, ego, selfishness, and greed, which was the characteristic of the religious leaders and elders. And repentance is a dance between us and God. I cannot do it merely on my own effort. I cannot change my life simply by wanting to. I need God's help. My willingness joined to God's power creates new life. Repentance is accepting God's acceptance of me and recognizing God's acceptance of you and then going through life relating to the people as Jesus would, seeing people as beloved and treasured, made in the image of God, and giving them the dis dignity and respect that is accorded God's precious child. Jesus, as he always does, uh, is in this passage pointing us back to what matters and what lasts, and what is, e what is eternal, what is significant for our souls, what transforms from this life into the next life. That each of us are made in God's image and likeness. And no matter our outer condition, no matter what we may have done to distort that image, no one is ever beyond the reach of God's grace and forgiveness. And so the journey of the Christian life is to see ourselves and our neighbors in that light. To see through the eyes of Jesus the truth of who we really are and who we really are becoming. So repentance is both my inner renewal and acceptance of God's acceptance of me, 
and that works itself out in an outer reality in the way that I treat people and how I share the good news of God's acceptance to those around me. And Christian life is at its heart this allowing myself to be open to being lovingly confronted with the reality of God's love and what I do with that gift. So in the moments and days of our lives, we continue this journey of changing, changing our minds, letting our hearts be changed, becoming like the tax collectors and prostitutes in their willingness to follow Jesus, to live new lives. And as we share that life together, we live in the hope that as we see Christ face to face, we will continue to be made new people in his presence. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>